Hey everybody, welcome to Allure of the Poor. I am your host, Lori Budd. I am a UC Davis winemaking graduate and a WSET level two graduate. And today I am so, so, so excited. I mean like so to infinity excited because, you know, social media is really brings the world, makes the world a smaller place. And I, my guest today, we have been chatting on Twitter for a very, very long time. And I adore reading her, her writings. And just recently, she started doing these cool animated videos um, of the wine tastings. And I absolutely love them, and I get so excited when I see them as I'm scrolling through Twitter, and I see them, and I have to blow them up on uh, so that I can see what they are. But today, my guest is Andrea Lemieux, and she is like the Turkish wine guru. Like um, she, the the she talks about grapes that I have never ever heard of before, and every time I, she talks about it, I want to run out and try to find some. So, Andrea, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. I am so beyond thrilled to be here. Well, I mean, here, Istanbul here, but virtually here with you. <laughs> virtually, virtually here. Um, and I thank you. It's, it's really early in the morning or late at night, however you want to look at it, um, for you. So I appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with my listeners because this is very different than any other podcast that I have uh, ever done because, you know, these are grape varieties that just aren't in the common, you know, household yeah. here, you know, and you have such a passion, so you know me and my passion for wine, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's just so exciting. Um, but I did see you take a sip, so what I are did. you drinking? What are you drinking? <laughs> Yeah, it's 1.30 in the morning, so I, you know, let myself open a bottle. <laughs> there you go. I am drinking, actually, I've got the bottle right here. I am drinking um, uh, one of our best sparkling wines. This is called Yashasin. It's from one of our producers, Vinkara, which I know is available in the United States. I did check. Okay. It's available from a few retailers in the U.S., I think possibly even online. Um, and it's a Blanc de Noir, a traditional method sparkling wine made from the great Kalajit Karasa. One more time? <laughs> <laughs> it's called no. Kalajit Karasa. Kalajit Karasa. Yeah, Close exactly. enough? Close enough. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Enough. Well, I too am sipping, and um, we do, as you know, I have Wine for Bed Street after this, and uh, Debbie and I have made a pact that we don't drink the wine prior. Um, so it is a Dornfelder, and I am a little bit nervous because I didn't realize um, I picked up a sweet one. So... Um, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know they made sweet Jordan Neither That's did really I. interesting. Neither did I. Um, so, uh, I think I've only had one Dornfelder ever before. Um, mm -hmm. and now this is going to be a, a sweet one. So, so I am drinking Cab Franc. <laughs> <laughs> This is actually from Derby Estates uh, from Paso Robles. So, you know, I love to support local. And Derby is one of my uh, favorite wineries in Paso. I do frequent them um, on a regular basis. So, <laughs> virtually, I raise a glass with you, Slancha. And cheers. Afiyas Olsun, as we say in Turkey. All right. See, I'm learning so much already. <laughs> All right, so before we get into um, the wines of Turkey, um, mm -hmm. we got to get into a little bit about you. Um, so, you know, how and when did you get into wine? Oh, gosh. So I was a wine drinker when I lived in the U.S. I lived for quite a long time in D.C. So we had access to all of the, you know, the Virginia and the Maryland wineries. But I 
think beyond whether or not I liked the wine, I didn't think much more about it. And then I moved to Turkey <laughs> about seven years ago. Actually, seven years next week. <laughs> oh, um, <anniversary>. yeah. <laughs> and we don't get a lot of wine in the way of imported wine, certainly not quality imported wine. So I started drinking Turkish wine somewhat out of necessity. And somewhere along the way, kind of had this, what the heck is this great kind of moment? And started just reading about wine. And then I read some more about it. And then I started looking up wine blogs and, you know, visiting wineries here. And it just, I don't know, it just, just kind of happened. I just kind of fell into it. And a few years ago, I was in Italy on a food tour. And the uh, the tour guide was telling us that she was a certified sommelier, um, had done her studying in both Italy and Australia, I think she said. And it just kind of hit me. I went, oh, a wine is a job. That's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> no. So I was like, oh, I know what I want to do when I grow up now. <laughs> That's awesome. So what actually oh, no. made you go to Turkey? I got transferred here for work. Oh, okay. Um, for, yeah, for a job that was like a short-term project, but I kind of fell in love with Istanbul and never really liked D.C. all that much, so I decided to stay. And, uh, yeah, seven years later, don't regret it. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. It's nice to hear a positive relocation thing, you know, like, you know, you hear lots of times that people relocate to another country or whatever, and then that job kind of dissolves, and then they're stranded. So it, yeah. it's actually really nice to hear a positive, you know, <laughs> a positive thing. What, what went through your mind when they said, hey, do you want to go to Turkey? I actually was so thrilled. I had been here maybe a year previous to my move on holiday fell in love with the city so much that I almost called my roommate back in the States to say, sell my stuff for rent. I'm not coming home. Wow. Um, I know. So I had all these plans to quit my job and move out here on my own and do I don't know what. And then suddenly a project here opened up and they needed somebody to come out here and, and represent it. I know. It's, it's kind of exactly that. Um, wow. So it was really, really lucky for me. Yeah. All the stars were aligned for you. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. I, mean, I think about how difficult it was or how, not difficult, crazy it was for us to relocate from New Jersey to California. I can't imagine the logistics of, <laughs> of relocating to another country. I mean, I'm not lucky in that regard, too, though. Did you? I made my parents ship all my boxes, <laughs> so I just packed them and moved here with a suitcase and then made them ship everything later. <laughs> well, you got them like a month later? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. So now, so what exactly do you do and and do you have a professional wine job? <laughs> Well, my day job, as I like to call it, I do um, consulting for an events management company here. So mostly we arrange large meetings for international companies who want to come to Turkey to hold events. Um, it has nothing to do with wine, but it pays for my wine, so that's what's important. <laughs> um, but then kind of in addition to that, um, I don't really get paid for it. I maybe break even if I'm lucky. I give wine tasting um, on mostly a monthly basis, mostly to other foreigners, but also I have a number of Turks who come to my tastings who also don't know about their wine. Um, and just trying to spread the word about Turkish wine and how good it actually is. <laughs> and that that's, I mean, I think that's so cool because you're, you're totally sharing your passion with, with, you know, other people who want to learn, and that's that's incredible in, in my world, you know. It's so much fun. It really is. I absolutely love doing it. 
And now are your, is, is your education self-taught? Did you take classes, combination? Because we all self-teach at some point. <laughs> We do. We do, yeah. No, it's a combination. It's mostly self-taught. Um, I did take and manage to pass the first WSCT level here. Um, I'm hoping to skip two and go directly into three because courses one and two are only offered in Turkish here. And my Turkish got me through level one, but I really don't think it will get me through level two. <laughs> yeah. I do level three in English, so I'm um, hoping they'll let me skip the level. Um, oh, wow. Wow. Other than that, right, it's reading, it's uh, listening to podcasts, um, and it's talking to winemakers. I've visited the vast majority of the wineries here, and I've met some phenomenal people and have learned a lot from them. I, I think that, you know, I mean, I... I have it from a lot of different angles. You know, my, my undergrad and my graduate degree are in biology, microbiology, uh, which had nothing to do with the wine world. You know, it, I, honestly, my undergrad was marine biology. <laughs> so, oh, wow. I mean, I, I was supposed to be working with dolphins right now. Um, <laughs> Um, that little far cry, um, but you know, <laughs> um, but the biology and the microbiology definitely play a one, you know, play a big role in the winemaking world. And then we did go back. Yeah, and Mike, my husband, is a food scientist, so that obviously makes sense. But yeah, yeah. we both went back to school. We went to UC Davis to go through the winemaking program because we wanted mm -hmm. to focus in on that. Um, mm -hmm. And every vintage, you learn something new. Like it's on, on the job, hard. you know, or, you know, on the dirt training basically, you know, every, you know, <laughs> every, every vintage something new comes up or, you know, you develop right. something different. Um, but I did go through the, um, I skipped level one WSET, okay. and I went with level two, and I graduated, I think it was May, I, I just did it, um, I think it was May, and I I was stressed over it, you know, and everybody oh, in my goodness. class was like, oh my God, you're a winemaker, you can do this, I'm like, no, 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 this is a whole different ball game, this is, yeah. you know, you know, send me 50 or 100 questions on winemaking, I'm going to be all right, but, you know, you know, Australia and, you know, sending out good vibes to Australia today, but, or, you know, like learning the regions and Italy, all the DOCs and all that, that's a whole oh different. Oh, my gosh, and France, France terrifies me. I am terrified. Yeah. Uh, um, my husband asks, he's like, so are you going to do WSET3? Like, you know, are you going to do it? And I'm like, not at the moment. Like, <laughs> I put way, to, you know, I've got, I think I have 450 index cards from level two. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Well, you know? I see other people studying for level three, and I am terrified because I'm like, oh, oh, I'm not studying at that level. Should I be studying at that level? Oh, my God, what am I doing? Right, right, you know. Um, a couple of the people who were in the class with me went on to level three, and uh, they, 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 they all passed. Um, and they're like, oh, you can do this without it. I'm like, you have no idea what I was doing at night to, you know, get that, uh -huh. you know. But I'm way too competitive. Like, I can't just pass. I had to pass with distinction. And, uh -huh. you know, and if I didn't, it would have been a complete failure to me. You know, I'm like, uh -huh. I'm, you know, I'm, and I'm not saying people who don't pass with distinction is failure. Uh -huh. It's it's my personality. It's exactly. It's a self-motivational or self Terrorism, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's masochism, right? It's like, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, all right, so you have a combination of education, and I think hands-on is, is again, nothing against books or whatever, but I think hands-on is really what makes it, at least for me, makes it stick in my yeah. brain more so. Yeah, you know. Same. Here. I can honestly say out of those 450 index cards, probably about 300 of them are out of my brain already, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is. Um, all right, so let's get to uh, Turkey. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. All right, so for those who, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna lie, there was no turkey in WSET level two. <laughs> no, I imagine there was not. I don't think there maybe gets a paragraph in the level three book <laughs> at most. Right. So, so let's start off with where is it for us yes. geographically, you know, poor people. There. <laughs> no, don't be silly. No, I mean, Turkey Turkey's actually quite huge. It's just kind of stuck in the middle of a bunch of things. So I think it often gets overlooked if you're looking at a map. Um, but it famously straddles two continents, or rather Istanbul does anyway, and borders uh, Bulgaria and Greece to the west, and Georgia, Armenia, Iraq, Iran, and Syria to the east. Um, and then, of course, we've got the Mediterranean, the Aegean, the Black Sea. I mean, it's, it's right in the middle of everything. Um, and it's huge. It covers some 300,000 square miles, I think, um, oh. home to 80 million people. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, I mean, we have 20, 20 of those are in Istanbul, I think. <laughs> wow. Well, that's uh, all, you yeah. know, I think that's all people ever see it, yeah. it, is Istanbul. It's Istanbul. Yeah. Istanbul or maybe um, maybe the coast. There are quite a lot of really beautiful like resort beach Is areas there? here, yes, along the, the Aegean and the Mediterranean. So um, I think, yeah, you see Istanbul and you see the coast. All right. Okay. And see, now I'm going to be really naive or, well, I'll admit my stupidity here. There's no, completely safe Istanbul, like no oh. issues, nothing, yeah. right? We don't have anything like the, you know, the trains that are in India, that, right? It's very <laughs> modernized, right? <laughs> it is very modern, yes. It's very, very modern. Uh, and they are expanding the metro every year, which for which we are ever so grateful because it is a huge city. You could drive, I think, for two hours in any direction, even without standard Istanbul traffic and still be technically in the city. Uh, I mean, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's more of a state than a city properly. It, it's, it's a huge, huge area. How, how many, like, airports, like, for the whole country, like... Oh, gosh. You've got you've to gotta have multiple airports, right? Because it's massive. There are two in Istanbul. Um, well. Izmir has one, I think. Ankara has just one. Um... Brabzon, Elaza, Marga. I mean, no, there are airports everywhere. It's everywhere. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a huge, huge country. And there is a fast train that goes, I think, from Istanbul to Ankara. And there are a few other places where the train goes. But otherwise, it's the bus, which, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I won't be on a bus if it's longer than three hours. That's my rule. <laughs> the bus or it's airplanes. Because, yeah, it's a big country. All right. So you you can you literally fly from one part of Turkey to another part more. Yes, yes, absolutely. And in visiting the wineries, yeah, we fly into an airport somewhere, we pick up a rental car, and then we go from there. And sometimes it's still another hour or two drive until we hit the first winery. <laughs> well, so that actually was going to be one of my questions. Is like um, Istanbul? That that's your that's your main city, your state that you're talking about. Are there wine regions within there, or is everything outside of there? Everything is outside, but the closest wine region, we do have some, if you just count the traffic, there are some wineries that are within an hour and a half to two hour drive. So you can do a day trip uh, if you want to get up really early. <laughs> I don't usually. <laughs> It's, it's tough to wake up early to then go drive, to then go drink, and then to go drive back. It's tough. That's it is. It is. It is. <laughs> it is. Um, so what what climate would you say that that the wine regions typically have? Oh, ev everything, everything, truly. I think it's because it is such a vast country. So if you're up in, um, like, Thrace, which is kind of our nearest wine region, and that's where the border with um, Bulgaria and Greece is, I, you know, Thrace, they all have their own. Um, there it's very kind of cold continental. I think they have snow oh. already. And we, we get snow like maybe two or three days 
out of the whole year in Istanbul, oh. which I appreciate. I hate snow. <laughs> I'm with but it's you. covered with snow up there. But then you go down to the extreme southwest of the country to um, the Mardin media area, which is um, right on the border with Syria. And there it's um, no more of an arid continental, I think, but we also have Mediterranean. There's the oceanic influences. It just mm -hmm. it all depends on where you are in the country. And there are small wine regions kind of yeah. right around the whole, the whole that huge landmass. Um, so, excluding wine, right, mm -hmm. for one moment, what's like Turkey's like import export? What um, importing? I think they import a lot of cars, uh, electronics, like personal electronics, phones, computers, that kind of thing. Um, I know I'm missing something else, but it's a lot more industrial electronic kind of thing. Export-wise, they make a lot of, um, oh, what do you call them, like household appliances. There are two really big companies here, and they export mostly to Europe. They're really big. Um, they're big shipbuilders, which I learned while doing a little bit of research for this. <laughs> <laughs> they built, like, high-end yachts, I guess. Uh, I know, right? That was, that was new to me. Um, they're also one of the world's largest producers of, if not actually the largest, hazelnuts and uh, raisins. <gasps> is they the are competing sixth, with my friend now? <laughs> they, they are, I'm sorry. They are the sixth largest grape producing country in the world. Wow. Wow. A huge chunk of that goes into raisins. Wow. Do they, they don't have, do they have a, you know, like we've got some kissed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like is that raisin made? Whatever do they have their own? Do they have their own brand of raisin, or are they exporting <laughs> the, that for us? <laughs> the, I don't think it. I honestly don't think it gets exported under the Turkish name. I have okay. a feeling that they have contracts with uh, okay. with international yeah companies. Wow, that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Yeah. All right. All right, so let's get down to some some WSET stuff here <laughs> that is not in any book that you're ever going to read as of now. So let's talk about a little bit of the history of Turkish wine. You know, when you know when did it start? What are their oh, main? You know, what do they do? <laughs> that, that's like such a huge. It's like how much time do you have? <laughs> So Turkish wine history goes back to the Hittites. Um, I think they have a pretty similar timeline with you know Georgia and Armenia as far as having that level of history. And the Hittites were serious about their wine. Like they laid down regulations that then carried on to the Greek and the Roman populations as they came through. Um, but that kind of history aside. <laughs> um, Modern winemaking didn't really begin here until about the 40s. Uh, for a very brief period, sorry, rewinding a little bit, because this is a really cool little factoid, I think. For a very brief period, the Ottoman Empire was the largest wine exporter to Europe. Um, this was when Tuxera first came through and was devastating Europe, and they had no wine because they had no more vineyards, right? Turkey hadn't been hit yet. It did get hit eventually, but it hadn't been hit yet. The Ottoman Empire was exporting more wine to Europe during that period. It's something like six times the current annual production. Wow. I know, right? It's really kind of cool. Um, but then the Turkish Republic came in, uh, and there was the population exchange when all of the Greek Turks went back to Greece, and all of the Turkish Greeks came back here. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, but unfortunately, Turkey lost most of its winemaking knowledge at that period. Um, so there was a big chunk of about 20, 30 years when wine really petered off here. Um, and then it came back in around the 40s with um, two of our biggest, oldest companies, Dolija and Cavazzadeti. And then it kind of went along, eh, you know, okay, for a couple few years. But it wasn't really until the 90s that really quality winemaking started here. It started with two small wineries who really 
spearheaded this um, small production quality winemaking here. Uh, and then it got another boost in the early aughts, I think, when the Turkish government was giving grants to um, new winemakers to put in vineyards and to keep the, keep the industry going. Um, so now we have something like 160 registered wineries. Um, I know, it's actually quite large. <laughs> so it's quite large for what people think the wine industry might <laughs> be, not comparatively. <laughs> um, but I would, I would hesitate to guess that maybe only 80, 90 of those are really quality wineries. A lot of the rest of them are bulk production uh, that you don't really, they don't really have recognizable commercial names. And now when, when you go into, do, do you have like wine shops? Food shops, like, or like, do you have dedicated wine shops? I'm so not do. stupid when it comes to outside. You know, you no, know, like, no, no. Why do well, why, why would you know? I mean, you must come, obviously, and check these out yourself. But no, we do. Um, particularly in Istanbul and Izmir and a few other cities, because uh, I mean, gastronomy has really started taking off here, and um, wine has been able to kind of hitch its star to that okay. as well. But there are a number of dedicated bottle shops. Um, we have a couple of really great little wine bars here in Istanbul. Um, but we also have, uh, well, we have Carrefour. So, Carrefour. Um, uh, but between them and a couple other big grocery store chains, you can also get pretty decent wine just at the local grocery store. And are the wines that are in that shop, are they, I mean, not, not exact, obviously, but are you getting, a, you know, are you getting American wine? Are you getting French wine? Are, you know, are you getting, are you able to get a sample of the main wine regions? To a degree, uh, we actually don't have a lot of American wine. We see a little bit of Californian wine and one or two Washington State wines, but the both because of the alcohol taxes and the import taxes, imported wine here is maddeningly expensive. Um, but we do also see a lot of European wine, French mostly, um, Turks love Bordeaux. You could drown in the amount of Bordeaux here. <laughs> um, but we get wine from Germany and Austria and every once in a while you might even see a wine from Lebanon. Um, so I know it's, it's really kind of interesting what you can and can't get here as far as the selection. Now, see, now you can have a conversation about wine and import and export. Now, the tariffs would have no impact on you. Are the no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we're already getting hit really hard by the our own tariffs here. <laughs> so, what what yeah. do you can you name a Californian wine that you're that you can Readily get? Red, readily. I'm not so sure about readily. Um, um, oh, what is the maker? Oh, this is killing me. I, there's, a, there's a California Zinfandel wine that we can get in duty free, and I suddenly am just completely forgetting the name of it. Um, <laughs> It, it's one of, yes, it's, so Michael David, oh, no, I wish, although oh. maybe we can get Michael David here. I'm just trying to see, like, what would a bottle, uh, what would, all right, so forget the name, what, what would a bottle oh. of a, that California Zin, if you were living here versus uh -huh. if you were living, okay. if you were living so now? let's say, um, let's say back when I lived in D.C. and went to Trader Joe's all the time, and my 8 to $10 bottle of wine from Trader Joe's is going to set you back at least $30 here. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah, yeah I, I don't, I, I drink a lot of Turkish wine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not really any cheaper depending on how far up the quality chain you go. Okay. But at least you have got off the quality chain, right. and, and especially for me, knowing how much that bottle would have cost me in the state, sometimes I just 
I just can't. Torture. You know? Right. 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 It's always funny when you know you can get it for a certain price. You know, like if you just walked in and you're like, oh, $30 for this. Okay. But when you know you can get it for $8 someplace else, yeah. it, you know, it, it's, it's a little torture. A little torture. Yeah, that yeah, is. It is. It is. I drink a lot when I go back to the States. <laughs> <laughs> Got to make up time. I do. I do. I have people pre-shop for me and I have my bottles ready to go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Um, well, the next time you come back, you'll have to let me know because I have um, a very good friend who lives in Annapolis, right outside of D.C., yeah. so um, I can always crash at his place. Uh, Ryan, I'm coming to crash at your place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I could uh, always crash at his place, and then we could have a real-in-life meetup. That would be so brilliant. And, I would absolutely uh, love that. He would be more than happy to drink wine with us, I'm sure. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm sure. All right. So, um, do you have do, of our of this wine regions that you have? Hmm. Um, I'm assuming there's some bigger players and some smaller ones. Are the bigger ones more bulk, or can you get quality with the with the big with the bigger ones? You can absolutely get quality with the bigger ones. Yes. Um, so the bigger ones simply. Uh, well, simply, that's the wrong word, sorry. Um, they just hit all of the price points. Okay. So uh, we have the wineries that offer everything from, uh, we have this term here in Turkey. Um, in Turkish, it's kipek uderen, which literally means dog killer. So there are some of the bigger, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> There are some of the bigger wineries here who offer everything from that level to super premium. Okay. Um, hit, yeah, hitting all the price points. So. Okay. And, and then we have a lot of small producers now as well, which is really brilliant. Okay. And how easy is it for you to go, like, if you wanted to go wine tasting, do these people have tasting rooms that are open to the public? Do you have to schedule appointments? It depends a lot on where you go. Uh, wine tourism is a really missed opportunity right now in Turkey. Okay. Uh, a lot of the wineries are trying to change that. A lot of them are doing their best to change it, and quite a few areas have formed um, partnerships amongst the wineries themselves. They developed their own wine routes to help encourage this, and they built um, you know hotels attached to their wineries and restaurants because quite often there's nothing else. Around them, <laughs> um, but for the most part, yes, you do still need to make appointments. Either because in some cases they are just that popular, um, or because they don't—they're so small and out of the way, they don't necessarily actually have the facilities. But they are always happy to welcome people. Uh, Turkish hospitality is such an amazing thing. Yeah. Um, and then when you combine that with wine people, and I don't care where they're from, I think wine people are just some of the most hospitable and welcoming people ever. Um, we have to do that. We always have alcohol in our system. <laughs> <laughs> that, that probably doesn't hurt. <laughs> but I mean, especially when you're here, and here as a foreigner, they are just so, I think, partially flabbergasted and just so heartwarmed that you as a foreigner are interested in their in their wine and in their yeah, and their weird little grapes. Their their God forsaken grapes. <laughs> ah, see? See? So yeah, that it was like actually a perfect uh preface to this conversation, the God Forsaken Grapes. And I was so yeah. happy to see you be part of it. Um, I was so thrilled to take part. It's, usually it's so hard for me to source wine that's appropriate <laughs> for the wine pairing weekend uh, activity. And I saw this and I went, wait a that's, second. That's my thing. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> this is my whole country. Wait a second. Yes, it is. <laughs> And I had to, I had to actually really, really laugh at the umlauts because it is. You put the umlauts in there, and and Americans run away, man. It's, 
It's, uh, you know, that's, I've said that with m several of the, you know, other regions that I've tasted through. You know, same thing with, with Greece. It's like, these wines are incredible. Your cat? They are. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Running back and forth. <laughs> Um, you know, Greece has some amazing wines, but you you need a, a the you know a, a translation book with you in order to to know what you're drinking. And I think Americans are terrified terrified of that. And yeah. Yeah. I get it. I get it. When I first got into wine, I would definitely pick something I could I recognized oh. over. Uh -huh something I had never heard. Now I'm like, nope, no, that one. Ooh, what's this? You know, now, it's, now I'm going after the ones that I've never heard of before, you know? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, speaking of Greece, it's, you know, not that I want to plug another country over my own adopted country, um, but I went last year to their big, huge wine festival, Onorama, uh, which is like the first weekend in March. And we made a beeline for, they had a special section for um, essentially unheard of grapes. Oh, okay. And we just went straight there. And it was like, tell us about these things that we have no idea what they are. Right? <laughs> yeah, See? it's brilliant. The Wine Geeks Unite, man. That's where we want to be. That's where we want to be. Absolutely. And unfortunately for Turkey, they have both umlauts and they have that little hat over the G, G. Uh, yes, and then they have the, I actually don't know what the term for it is, the little thing under the C. C? Yeah, I don't know what that's called either. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know no what idea. that's called either. But I know, but I, you know what, I think that's a little less intimidating. The little C, I think people just see the yep. C, like, you know, but yeah. Yeah, the the umlaut and yeah. the G, the, 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 whatever that thing is, it, yeah, that's a little, little more, you know, nerve wracking there. Fair yeah, yeah. <laughs> so with that being said, before we actually get mm. into these godforsaken grapes of Turkey, <laughs> um, do you have indigenous grapes there? Do you have the international, no, I'm sorry, not indigenous, uh, the international oh. grapes there? Oh, yes, yes, yes. They are, I'm sorry to say, more popular than the indigenous grapes. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I, I mean, if I could hazard a guess, I think it would be because when the wine industry really kind of came back here, people were traveling to Europe, especially France, and they were learning about wine there, and they came back, and so they started, we didn't have wine here at the time, right? So they were emulating what they had learned. Um, so Syrah is actually, I think, the third most widely planted grape here, um, oh. and the first most popular of, of all of the grapes. It goes um, Sultania, Akusizu, and Syrah. Oh. Um, but Syrah, Cab, Merlot, Cap Franc, um, lots and lots of Chardonnay. Uh, we even have one producer up in Thrace who is planting, I think, just kind of every grape that he can think of. He, he just loves to experiment, God bless him. So he's got, in addition to a bunch of indigenous grapes, he has Riesling and Alvarino, and he's even planting some Greek grapes now, and Mavrud, which is Bulgarian, and I mean, he's just wow. doing everything. Yeah. Wow. See, that's cool because, you know, like 10 years down the road, he's going to be like dominant because he's going to mm -hmm. really learn which grapes really can grow in that environment, and, and then exactly. everybody's going to be behind the eight ball trying to catch up with him. Yeah, he's smart. Exactly. Yeah. He's yeah. Smart. He's smart. All right, so let's get to these umlauts and the things with the G and all of that stuff. So <laughs> let's go over a few of your your most common indigenous grapes and tell me what what can we expect, you know, if we ever can get our hands on these in our glass. Okay, so I think, well, I already mentioned that the first or the most widely planted black grape variety here is called Akuz Guzu. It's also one of the harder ones to say. It's got four umlauts in it. Plus, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Um, it means bull's eye. Oh. Um, because the grape itself is quite large, round, and very, very black in color. So it looks like a bull's eye. Um, it's kind of, if I would compare it to an international grape, it's kind of like our Merlot. 
It's got okay. a little bit more lushness and roundness on the palate. Um, very fruit forward, uh, but also tastes very well to, to oak. Um, and then is kind of a natural blending partner with a grape called Boazke, which means throat burner. Because this is... <laughs> Sometimes they have really great names for these grapes. It's called throat burner because it is so tannic. It is so highly tannic that wow. if it's made clumsily, it will. It will just, yeah. <laughs> It'll not do nice things to you. If made well, it can be really beautiful and has a lot of structure. Like a like, it, well, it's, I guess it's our cap. Okay. Um, and then the third most common black grape is the, the one that I'm drinking, the Kalajik Karasa. Um, and this is kind of like our Pinot. Um, it's very flexible. We have everything from white to, uh, well, yeah, lots of Blanc de Noir, because it's high. Um, rosé, it's a very nice grape for rosé, um, especially if you like it. We don't have a lot of sweet rosé, thank God. Um, <laughs> not a fan, sorry. <laughs> They're usually quite dry. But Kalajit Karasa, one of the um, most common aroma notes from it is cotton candy. So it really lends itself well as like a nice summery rosé. Um, but it can make some very serious red wines and is in fact one of the more ageable uh, red wines made here. Wow. Um, then we have for white, Naringe, which is kind of our Chardonnay. Okay. Um, it does both very well in showing terroir. It's grown across the country now, and it's very different depending on where it's grown. But it's also very malleable um, and can take a lot of oak in the way that Chardonnay often can. Um, does it become buttery? Then, do they do buttery? It does. Yeah. Absolutely. Buttery and nutty and butterscotchy and, and all of those things. Um, and then I think Emir is our other really big white grape. Okay, we can and this pronounce is that one. We can pronounce that one. <laughs> it is. It's a little easier. It's a little more common of a, um, of a word. Um, and this is from the Cappadocia region, the, the region that you, um, we have the fairy chimneys and cave churches. And if you see pictures of Turkey with like hot air balloons, that's all Cappadocia. And that, I'm not sure I can give a good comparison for that. It's a little bit, Alvarino, it's a little bit Sauvignon Blanc, it's a little bit of a lot of things, but it often gets described as being slightly sulky uh, oh. because of the minerality in it. And it's, it's, it's oh, I bet I would grape. love that. Oh, it's such a brilliant grape. It really is. But it does not do well with oak at all, so it is never <laughs> oaked. Um, but it does often get blended. Um, apparently, it's a very difficult grape to grow. Oh, okay. Salinity, salinity in a wine is is my Love. kryptonite man i just will bow down to to it in there you know absolutely the, yeah. the first time i had an albarino from uh, uh rias i was i was all right sign me up i'm in love i'm in love and you know yeah, i think you would really like our Amir then uh, and it's but you know i i'll go everywhere and i will try the albarino and they just can't they they can't get it like Rio Spices can. They do, you know, it's it's know. very unique and and um, you know I get all excited. Yay, Albarino! Oh, uh, you know, and it's good wine, yeah. but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's it's not got that edge. Yeah, right. absolutely. Right, and and, then, and that's actually very similar to the Albarino has mm -hmm. has that same salinity. Um, mm -hmm. And neither of them. Well, some some are going into oak, but you know they're mostly they're mostly steel. Thanks, yeah. Steel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So now, can we get any of those here in the United States? We can. In fact, that's why I mentioned those specifically because if you can find them, those are going to be the grapes that you can find. Um, the Amir, I know specifically, the Tour Fund Company, which is one of our larger companies. It has a long, long history in Cappadocia. I know that they're in the U.S. Okay. Um, Kalajit Karasa, I know you can get, in fact, the, the sparkling wine that I'm drinking tonight, I, I know you can get um, the Acruzgu de Bois here. You should be able to find some of these. A lot of them are, let me think, 
they're, they're kind of, it's, it's coastal, kind of where you can get the Turkish wines. So it seems to either be like California or Washington State or uh, New York, Connecticut, interestingly. There's a retailer there. Um, there are a couple of places in the D.C. area. I know, right? Connecticut, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, and I think they ship pretty widely to the retailer in Connecticut. So. Okay. Uh, you've got to you've got to um, send me a message of the actual one you're really I drinking will. because absolutely you, you know can, can I savor it? Sorry, <laughs> can I savor, can you savor it? Savor it? I'm all over it. <laughs> I have never tried to savor a wine, so I don't know about this one. Savorability. <laughs> it, it's a true sparkling, though, right? Is it a true? It spark is. It is a true sparkling, um, and in fact. The, the owner of this particular winery, um, when she opened her winery, her number one goal was to make the first traditional method sparkling wine with a native grape. And she did it. She did it. She did it. She was the first. And so a bunch of people have followed. We now have a really wide range of sparkling wines here made everything from, you know, just adding CO2. We have tank method and we have a lot of traditional method, uh, wines, but made out of Turkish grapes, and it's, it's really exciting. That's awesome. She's my hero. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, all right, so what if, if you had to pick your favorite child, <laughs> which is the, horrible, the most horrible question, um, See, it's easy for me. Like, everybody knows it's Cab Franc. It's a piece of cake. Right. Um, nobody even asks me that question. Uh, but if you had to pick a favorite child, uh, what what would it be? You know, I thought about this, and it's such a hard question to answer, not just because I, I really do love a lot of the grapes, but we're still really learning what a lot of these grapes can do. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that Turkey has no appellation system. We have no viticulture errors. There's, there's nothing like that here. So winemakers are experimenting with grapes across the country. So this Amir that's from Cappadocia with its volcanic limestone, you know, tooth soils, tastes so different there than it does on the Yunnan Plateau in, in Izmir, which is more of a Mediterranean, like, um, uh, what's the word, like, really environment, or, like, really mineral-rich um, soils and everything. So we, we still don't really know or what we can't really where. pin down yet exactly what a lot of the personalities of these grapes are. So it's so hard to answer that. It's like the so, wild um, west of grape growing. It really is. I mean, in our Orla region, which is... Um, Orla is um, part of the Izmir, the Aegean region. Um, they have one of the most well put together wine routes, very easy to follow. Uh, they have everything from Bolazkere and Nadinja and Cabernet to Echigaina. That was a new grape for me. Um, uh, what else is down there? Uh, Sangiovese, um, Tanat, uh, Marcelon. Wow. No, I mean, they have everything. So it's, it, it's very experimental here. It's really kind of cool. Well, I think that's kind of the way a lot of wine regions get their start, right? They, mm -hmm. they just, you don't know what your region is good at. So exactly. you, you're, you're basically, you know, Whole, you know, taking your odds, you know, favoring your yes. odds and saying, if I plant all of these, you know, and I, you know, I start to play with them, I can always rip these up and plant what really works. So it's, I, I think they're following in the pattern of most well-established wine regions. This is what they do. I know um, Arizona, I ha there's a couple of wineries I know in Arizona that are doing exactly the same thing. They're, they're mm -hmm. producing, you know, I interviewed somebody and they're producing like 20 different wines. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh my gosh. Like, well, we don't really know what goes well yet. So we kind of make it and then it goes in the tasting room and we hear what people mm -hmm. like and then we either pull it out or we, you know, bulk up the yeah. production. So I, they're following, I think, in the basic premise footsteps of, you know, 
we yeah. all can't be Bordeaux that have had, you know, all of these, you know, generations of, of, of growing. people that, yeah, yeah, do the work for us and tell us what works here and what doesn't. Exactly. Right. Who, who, by the way, are changing now what their rules are, right? So. They are adding new grapes, right? Right, right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So times times change, and you've got to adapt yeah. or or whatever. Um, yeah, so I get that. I get that. It's so different in different areas that it's it's a little it's a little tough. Um, now, do you buy most of your wines at the wineries, or are you going to your wine shop and uh, buying out the store? <laughs> <laughs> it's a combination. combination. It's, it's, it's a combination um, because. I've kind of set myself a mission that I want to try all of the Turkish wines before whatever nebulous date it might be that I leave the country. So I try not to buy the same wine more than once unless I just completely fall in love with it. Um, so it's, it's a combination. If I'm at a winery, I'll buy wine when I'm there, but I'm also always at the bottle shop. Um, I walk in and they, they know me so well now, they immediately tell me, oh, this is new. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. Let me have that then. <laughs> <laughs> You're the norm of Turkish wine. <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That yeah. is awesome. All right. So earlier I mentioned that those amazing videos that you make and the tasting cards. So yeah. like, tell me. I love them. I absolutely love Thank them. You. And, Thank uh, you. You know, it's it's like I see it starting, and I know it's you. So it's brand, you know, it's brand spot on. But it's so good. So how did you develop these? And are you doing these yourselves? Are the wineries helping you promote this? What's going on? Well, so when I got started with these. Um, I mean, these wine infographics are so popular now, and I think really kind of started by Wine Folly, and I, I, I love them so much. And then the, their new book came out, and they had incorporated, like, some new grapes, like some of the Greek varieties, um, but there were still no Turkish varieties. And I was like, we've we, we got to make these. Nobody else is doing this. we got to do this. Uh, so I partnered with... Um, a uh, project partner of mine already, co my co-author, and we found a phenomenal local graphic designer, um, Empathia Creative, and between the three of us, we came up with, uh, with first the tasting cards, um, and a lot of it, in some cases, was just us sitting down, tasting wines, going, all right, we think that it tastes like this, I mean, full disclosure. <laughs> coming to a consensus. I mean, some of these grapes, like the ones we mentioned before, Cusi du Bois, Cari, there are some standardized aromas and flavors that are supposed to be in these, but there are similar unusual grapes that maybe only one or two producers make and we know very little about. Okay. And extracting information from some of the wineries here is a lot like extracting tea. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So we did some of this research on our own. Research drinking. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's how we came up with the, uh, with the tasting cards, but then the videos, that was the sole genius of Empathy and Creative, of our graphic designer. She kind of came, she just presented us with this as, as an idea, and we fell in love with it, and so she took the images that she used on the tasting cards and, yeah, made these little, these little gifts out of them, and yeah, we, we're just so thrilled with them. We're so pleased. Now, what, what's your plan? Like, are you creating a tasting notes box or something that, that like, you can sell? Or, you know, wh where do you see that going? Because they're awesome. They really are. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, I mentioned a couple times that I have a, a partner. Um, uh, she writes under the name Istan Bites. Um, her, her blog is about beyond the kebab, Turkish food. Uh, she's, a Turk, uh, she's a food historian um, and herself a phenomenal um, patisserie bread baker. Um, and we are co-authoring a book about Turkish wine. Which will be, if we get a publisher, 
Um, it will be the first book written in about 15 years about Turkish wine. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so we want to put the tasting cards. A big section of the book is going to be about the indigenous grapes, and we want to include these as graphics with those. Um, yeah, we want to try to, you know, get people interested in Turkish wine, because I think if we can help make the demand abroad, get people interested in it, and if they start asking their bottle shops, then it will help, you know, get more, get more wine. Great. So. Right. If people ask, the wine shops will find a way to deliver. And I hope so. And, I mean, it, it might actually be a really good time to start doing that because they're <laughs> focusing in on it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, maybe the, the plans, which, as horrible as that is, and, and I, I'm so worried about the, the effect that those are going to have on the industry at large, but maybe they'll be good for us over here. <laughs> it will, you know, I mean, they're going to be, they're going to have to, if it goes through for however long of a period it's going to be, yeah. They're going to need something to replace it with, yeah. you know. So, yeah. you know, when one door closes, <laughs> you know, the window opens for somebody else, <laughs> you know. Hopefully that window looks on the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, we joke about the umlauts and, and that stuff, but what do you really think is the biggest reason there's – there's just that much of a difficulty of the Turkish wines coming here to the U.S. I think it's um, twofold. One, I mean, I I joke, but I do kind of want to name the book, Yes, They Make Wine in Turkey. Uh, so few people know that Turkey makes wine. So I think it's just, it just never even enters somebody's, somebody's mind that they could ask. For Turkish wine, um, but on top of that, for the producers here, you know, we have, you know, maybe five, six really big producers, and these are the ones that you'll find in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, but so many of the producers are smaller producers, uh, and so their stock is limited, which means that they by themselves can't really make up a full palette to export right. somewhere. Um, and there's there's some small cooperation issues amongst some of the wineries. Um, so getting them kind of together to, you know, make up a palette for somebody. I think you need, you know, an exporter who is really dedicated to Turkish wine to come over and be like, all right, look, I know you can't make, I'm just going to make up the palette myself, but I'm going to take your wine, I'm going to take your wine, and right. then I'm going to go back and just promote the crap out of this. <laughs> so it's, we have some of the supply, but we need to make the demand and then, yeah. It's, well, if, if that day ever comes that you come back to the United States, I think I see your, your new job when you come back to the United States. I actually would love to open my own wine bar if I go back to the States. Um, and focus on what I like, lesser appreciated wine countries and wine regions. Um, I mean, I'm very lucky living in Istanbul for any number of reasons, but with the, with the airport so poised to get you almost literally everywhere in the world, I have been really exposed to a lot of these smaller niche country producers. Like I go to Georgia every other year or so, I go to Greece twice a year, Wow. Slovenia, you know, I mean, and Austria and Germany, I consider them less appreciated, you know. I mean, they're just rebuilding their their mm -hmm. industries after they, they suffered so much in the 80s from their, there was that anti-free scandal. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm really lucky where I am. I get to just kind of hop over into the next country and explore somebody else's wines for a little while and, and come back and... Um, so I would really like to do that, but definitely I would include a huge amount of Turkish wine on my my wine list. <laughs> That's cool. It's like you could do a long weekend to all of these other countries. Would be like equivalent to like the East Coasters going west for oh, you know yeah. uh, 
you know, a California wine trip. Yeah, right? absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm very spoiled. Like right now, I'm I'm Hungarian wine insecure, and I'm going, oh my god, no, I only have like four bottles of Hungarian wine left. I have to go back. <laughs> yes. Yes, well, hun Hungary is very near and dear to me. We, uh, you know, we went there, and they're very Cab Franc. Villeneuve is very Cab Franc focused, and so they are. They, we were there uh, not this Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving before, to talk about Cab Franc, and so they, they near and dear to me, and I, I dream. It's a haunting dream how much I want to go back mm -hmm. there and um, and visit again. And to just you know, uh, and I mean Budapest is beautiful, and you know, oh, I love it. But, you know. but the Villene, I mean, I only got to see this much of it, and I want to see mm -hmm. so much more of it and explore explore the wines even more. It's it's a beautiful country. It really it is. It, it is. really is. I really really love it. Um, but speaking of Cap Franc, we do have quite a bit of Cap Franc here. I Gee. think every year somebody else comes out with another one, and it's so exciting for me. That's because they've heard of Cap Franc Day, right? <laughs> I think they have. I think they have. No, I'm serious. The, the Turkish wineries are getting more into social media, and um, they're more Instagram versus Twitter. Okay. Um, but, yeah, everybody was here promoting Cap Franc Day, so it was, it was really cool. Oh my God! Really, I was like being sarcastic, but really, oh my God! No, no, seriously, absolutely. Oh wow, wow. Well, maybe I'll have to make a trip out there in December and uh, and uh, celebrate Cap Franc Day with you and them. That would be phenomenal. No, really, we have yeah. a lot of really beautiful Cap Franc here. Really, it 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 blows my mind that uh, that my little wine holiday. Um, is international now. It really, it, you know, it blows my mind that that so many countries are doing it. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I honestly am so shocked that there wasn't one before. Capron is such an important grape. I know. And it's a delicious yeah. one. So how is this not a thing before? But I absolutely love that you did this. Yeah. And yeah. I would really love to be able to follow in your footsteps and make some sort of what I'm calling hashtag Turkish Grape Day. There you go. There you go. I don't know what it would be yet, but it it just requires a lot of time sitting on the computer and and reaching out to and you have the connections, reaching out yeah. to different wineries and you know doing that. But um, it uh it's exhausting. <laughs> it's it's, it's oh, good. It must be. It must be. It's good. But well done, you really. Oh, uh, thank you. It is uh, it, it is amazing to see. It re it really is. Of course, we joke that now the Cab Franc fruit prices have gone up, and <laughs> but <laughs> get away the good with the bad, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Cab, Cab Franc is actually now more um, uh, expensive than Cab Sauv in the Napa Sonoma oh, region. Nice. It's it's starting to, yeah, wow. the, percentage, the percentage that Cab Franc has increased, you know, mm -hmm. has skyrocketed over the percentage that Cap, that Cap Sauv has. So it's really becoming a, you know, more than a blending grape. So it really is uh, becoming quite the thing. Oh, yeah. so, I, mean, I, mean, I used to think I was a Cab Sauv person. And then I started drinking more and more Cab Francs as they became more available here. And I was like, no, this is my Cab. Not, not <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love hearing that. Um, <laughs> I will have to try to, I will have to find a Turkish Cab Franc. I will have to try that. And if, if we can arrange this meeting in Annapolis, I will bring one for you. All right, yay! All right. Um, Okay, so if somebody is going to actually like travel to Turkey, mm -hmm. um, what what are like non wine things that you would say? All right, you know, first of all, how long of a flight is it from like the East Coast? Uh, well, if you get a direct flight, I think it's eight hours. Okay. So I never good. get a direct flight because I can't afford one. <laughs> <laughs> I 
right. Get to it. Also, I never mind stopping over in Germany and, you know, shopping and duty free <laughs> before yeah. I come back. I think Germany um, is my favorite layover place, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, Istanbul. I mean, you don't really even have to leave Istanbul if you don't want to. There is so much here, especially for history buffs. Um, we have the area of the city Sultan Ahmet, where right in this one small area we have the Hagia Sophia, which is one of the oldest Christian churches. It's huge. Apparently, off of her, her pedestal, the Statue of Liberty will fit under the main dome. This place is enormous. Oh my gosh. Yes. And I mean, this is like, we're talking like back in Constantine's era. This church is so old. Wow. Um, so we have that. We have the very famous Blue Mosque, which is beautiful. Uh, the Topkapi Palace, which is a proper Ottoman style palace. It's so stunning. There's an archaeology museum. There are Byzantine churches that, yeah, go back centuries. There are, I mean, throw a rock and you hit a mosque, and some of these are just stunningly beautiful places. Palaces. We have palaces all up and down the Bosphorus. Uh, you can take a Bosphorus tour. We have dolphins. I'm very exciting when I spot dolphins. Um, and if you go outside of the city, um, the easiest day trip for me is you fly into Izmir, um, get a little bus, and you go to an area called Selçuk, where in a day, you can do all of this in a day, and I've done it like eight times, so I know this is true. Um, you go to a place called Meriamana, which is the um, the last house of Mary, where Mary lived with um, St. John, um, to the ruins of the city of Ephesus, which are some of the best preserved Greco-Roman ruins in the Aegean. Uh, okay. The Ephesus Museum is stunning. Um, there are ruins for, I think it's the Basilica of St. John, where supposedly his... Like, he's entombed there. Oh, wow. Um, I, I know. And there are ruins nearby. Uh, we have Pamukkale, which um, is about a three-hour drive from there. These are the, the limestone travertines. Oh. You, just, just, yeah, just Google this place. It's, the pictures are stunning. Um, but this, is a hist this country is a historian's dream. Okay. Uh, we have ruins, I think, around every corner. <laughs> So there's a lot. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's awesome. And what about like food? What's your main main dish? Because that's always my problem. <laughs> uh, it's a big meat country. So if yeah. you like meat, this is a good place for you. Barbecue is a huge thing here. So they have oh. the kebab um, and uh, the the dinner the like you know the the big. Carnival things to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> um, but their mezes here are also incredible and varied. And we have the um, uh, English, English, um, like the the grape leaf. Uh, so very Greek, thing. Greek type Mediterranean food. Uh, Mediterranean is the more po politic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> politically <laughs> correct way to say it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> But also there's a lot of fish, so if you're not a meat eater, fish is so widely available here, um, particularly, um, again, I'm losing the English, anchovies. Anchovies, we love anchovies. Um, it's, a, it's a really wide food menu, and honestly, the farther east in the country you go, the better the food gets. Okay. All right, so there's a nice little tip for travelers. Okay. All right, so my last question is... <laughs> Um, going back to to the wineries, uh, if somebody was coming now to visit the wineries, are they planning like a day in this wine region and a day in this wine region, um, or can they really just travel about? I mean, I think a lot of it depends on how much time you have. Okay. Um, since you do have to fly to a number of the places, um, my suggestion would be to pick a region. Okay. And then do a couple of wineries there, but also hit some of these historical tourist sites. Um, you can combine a lot of them. Like for for example, we have a lot of wineries on the Gallipoli Peninsula, 
Um, so particularly every Australian I have ever met, you, you don't come to Turkey and not go to the Gallipoli Peninsula to Çanakkale and you know, see the war memorials there. But then across the water from that is Troy. Oh. So you can, yeah, so I mean, you can go enjoy that kind of Hellenistic history and some of the nice beaches and hit a few wineries. <laughs> Sounds like a perfect vacation. Sounds like yeah, a really. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, earlier you mentioned how there's snow in the upper north region or whatever. Is there a better time? Like, what is your peak tourist time versus when might people be able to get better deals? Type during the I year. Think peak tourist time is kind of May through September. Okay. Um, but we. Well, at least here in, in Istanbul and in the south and the east of the country, we have pretty warm and temperate weather through November, early December sometimes. Um, and you can also come as early as March or April. It might rain a little bit, um, but your prices are definitely going to be cheaper, and some of these uh, attractions are going to be far less crowded during okay. this period. Awesome, awesome. See, I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. You should come. I want to go. I have all these places that I'm like, all right. As soon as, as soon as I no longer have my day job, um, you know. And before we start the tasting room, I'm traveling. This is you know where people take that year off between you right, know right. college. I never did that, so I need between my day know. job. And my retirement job. I need I need that year where <laughs> where I travel. Yes, absolutely. We would love to have you here, really. Oh, I can't. Wait. Oh, I need to come. It sounds so awesome. It sounds so awesome. <laughs> All right. So as you know, since you listen, I always end these interviews with my little Phoebe game of opposites. Yes. Uh, so um, <laughs> I'm just going to say two words, and uh, whichever one, you know, resonates with you first, I guess, um, we'll do that. We're going to start off with some non-wine terms, and then we will move on to some, uh, on to the wine terms, okay? Okay. okay. All right, here we go. Night or day? Night. Sunset or sunrise? Ooh, sunrise. Sunrise. Black or white? Black. Walk or run? Oh, walk. I don't run. <laughs> I don't run anywhere. <laughs> uh, food or drink? Drink. <laughs> Old world, new world? Old world. Sweet or dry? Oh, both? Can I have both? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Bubbles are still. <sighs> so well, I'm bubbles since that's what I'm drinking right now. <laughs> okay. Oak or stainless? Stainless. Drink now or drink later? Drink now. Blend or varietal? Varietal. Vintage or non-vintage? I would like to say vintage, but I can't really afford it usually. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Good answer. Okay. Um, cork or screw cap? Cork. Commercial or indigenous? Indigenous. Bordeaux or Rhone? Rhone. Warm climate or cool climate? Cool climate. And Napa or Sonoma? Turkey. Sonoma. <laughs> I know, right? I'm like, when was the last time I had a wine from either of those places? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and to share all your knowledge of Turkey and Turkish wines. And, you know, I really. It's such a pleasure and an honor, really. I just. This was such a highlight, and then starting my year this way. This is so brilliant. Oh, and I just I really, it's so awesome to, to to like see you face to face and to to talk to you. And um, I really, you know, there's a lot. I shouldn't say this. There's a lot where you know, you know, Twitter. You just kind of scroll through, yeah, 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 yeah. But I always get excited when you're in my feed because 
I know it's oh, going to be something you. that I'm going to learn. It's going to be something thank that's so much. and so cool. Um, so, so that I'm not the only person, not that I am the only person, but yeah. so that other people can find you and see these awesome uh, gifts that you do and the things, uh, the uh, tasting cards and all that. Where can people find you on the social medias? Uh, so you can find me, I have a website, uh, thequirkycork.com. Um, you can also find me on Instagram under Quirky Cork or on Twitter. I think if you search Quirky Cork, I'll come up, but my official Twitter handle is lemieux.andrea. All right. And uh, it does. It does come up if you do Quirky Cork because because <laughs> um, like sometimes when I'm just like saying who am I going to tag, all I have to do is Q. And you, you come up. So it, it does come up under that. It's <laughs> <No. laughs> But anyway, so thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me. Thank you. And um, thank you so much. I, hope, I hope you can now decompress at 2.30 in the morning and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, get some sleep. I'm glad that you're working from home tomorrow that you can uh, catch up yeah, on. I can, I can sleep in, so as long as my cat will let me, so it's all good. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Um, I, I did see a tail go by once or twice. Yeah, she's somewhere, but she usually expects breakfast around 5, so she'll wake me up for that. Maybe close the bedroom door tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much, and it really it was, was a, uh, a pleasure to sit down and talk to you. And um, please let me know when you are coming uh, absolutely well. out here. Um, hopefully I will be on this coast when you are here. And uh, one of these days I'm going to make it there. I know I am. I yes. know I am. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. We're just going to put it out there. You're coming. Yes, absolutely. So thank you very much. And I will see everybody on the socials. And thanks for listening to Allure of the Poor. Slancha. Thank you, Bye.